everyone, this is Tabitha Lord from Book Club Babel, and I'm really excited today to be featuring Eric Mykrantz on our Author's Cut. So, hi Eric, welcome. Thanks for being here today. You have an amazing story to tell about your um, publishing journey, but first let's just jump into, you know, who is Eric, what does he do, and did you always want to be a writer? Are you a full-time writer now? You know, give us the, give us the background a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. Mind. So, uh, hi, it's, uh, it's so much fun to be on Book Club Babble. Uh, I really appreciate you inviting me on, Tabitha. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's jump into those questions. So, uh, first of all, I need to get in my first shameless plug. Absolutely. Uh, Eric Mykrans, author of The Reincarnationist Papers, which is now the Paramount picture, Infinite, starring Mark Wahlberg, that will be in theaters, COVID permitting, on September 24th. So I'm very excited about that. Now, let me jump in a couple of your questions. So today I'm, I have sort of like just started like less than a week as being a full-time writer, but like with training wheels. So um, I, for the last 20 years, I've worked at, uh, in Silicon Valley at the Oracle Corporation. And I just took a six month leave of absence last week in order to finish the second book in the series and to do interviews like Book Club Babble with you and to support uh, the movie launch that is in five months. And so I'm just sort of training as being a full-time writer right now. And it's, I'm still sort of dialing down the RPMs from the stress of my normal day job, but I'm loving it so far. Um, I, I have wanted to be a writer for a long time and I've written on and off for a long time. This is uh, the Reincarnation's Papers, it's my first novel, but it's got a long story that we'll get into in a minute. I've actually written two nonfiction books and I used to write for the Denver Post. I used to be a correspondent when I lived in Europe and uh, all the way back to university, uh, I actually studied Russian literature in university. So I cut my teeth on some of those, you know, Russian giants. And so I've really, I just, storytelling is just so cool. And I just have wanted to do it for so long. And now uh, Oracle has been really generous and has given me some time off to do it and to focus on it. So full-time writer with training wheels right here. Awesome. That's great. No, it's a, it's a big leap. And, you know, and, and any of us that have been doing it a long time know that you just don't leave the day job. You just don't until, you know, there's momentum going. And even then, you know, the momentum can crash at any moment as so much is out of your control. Having said that, that brings me to your publishing journey, which very much you took control of in a, in a different way. Now, um, was this published first in 2008? Is that correct? Or So uh, 2009. 2009, so, okay. Um, yep. Um, and I self-published it, yep. but I self-published it with a twist. And that's what I want to hear about is your twist. So you, even back in 2009, self-publishing was a bit different than it was, than it is today. Today, there's all sorts of industry that's popped up around it on how you can, you know, you need a cover artist, you need editors, you need help formatting. There's platforms, all kinds, you know, you can put it up on Kindle Direct, you can publish it on Wattpad or Inkit or any of these sites. So, you know, it's a very different world than it was back when the pioneers of self-publishing were, were taking this leap. So can you talk a little bit about why you made that choice and how it, things evolved from there? And I'm sure that will be. Yeah, yeah, because there are, some, there was some very different mechanics back then to get it done. And, right. and pioneer is probably a good term mm -hmm. in hindsight, right? Looking back 12 years to what it was like then, it was, it's so much easier to do it now. So um, I had always wanted to do the traditional publishing path. So I took the book out and uh, tried to get an agent and to get a publisher. And uh, surprise, I am the first author ever to be rejected by a literary agent. <laughs> uh, not, yeah. not, we all Understood. are. Right? Everybody is, uh, yeah. Yeah, I love you query, the Query, you're going to be rejected. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I love the stories that, you know, even the James Pattersons tell about being rejected, you know, 30 times or something like that, right? Yep. It like lets you know, hey, this is just what you're going to, know, this is just par for the course. Absolutely. Um, but here's the thing. I really, um, 
kept hearing great things from the readers that would read the earlier versions of it. And they would say things like, oh, I totally see this as a movie. I can't wait to read more. Please give me more. So I knew that it was a good book that could find an audience. And so what I decided to do in 2009 is I decided to self-publish the book. And the mechanics behind self-publishing then, this is before KDP, probably even before CreateSpace or right as CreateSpace was getting started that, that Amazon bought and turned into KDP. I self-published it on a platform called Lightning Source, which is now part of Ingram Spark, the, uh, uh, the, the and Ingram, the, the distribution channel. And it is it was painful to lay out and I had to get my own cover art and it was just really difficult to get it done. But Amazon would let you distribute it, which is actually key to my story because they would let me do print versions and they would let me do a, a, an ebook version. And I did both. Uh, but, I, uh, but I put a little twist on it that has made all of the difference in the world. And um, da, that da, da, twist. <laughs> da, 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 da. so that twist is actually sort of a combination of three things. Number one, I was you know interested in going the traditional route, so I knew that I would be engaging an agent, and the agent would be taking 10, 15, 20 percent, depending upon the vehicle, right, of the revenue right off the top. So I was comfortable paying someone to help me get to a wider audience. And then number two was the feedback that I kept getting from readers, that readers loved it. They would share it with others. They, and I just needed a vehicle to get it out there. And then the third thing was I borrowed a lesson from my day job at Oracle. And one of the things that we do when we're developing software at Oracle um, is we solicit our customers and our end users for their advice or their help. And the term that we use for that is called crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. And crowdsourcing is where you um, sort of define a goal and then you open it up for other people to help you reach that goal. And then you take their feedback and you create a better product. Uh, Linux operating system is a great example of that. Wikipedia is another great example of crowdsourcing. We all contribute to Wikipedia. We all edit each other's work on Wikipedia. So the combination between <clears throat> pay for an agent, readers love it, and crowdsourcing, I put all of those three things together into, into a unique marketing pitch, which was a reward that I put on the first page of the book, the lightning source printed and digital book. And that reward was to any reader who read the book, loved the book, and would make an introduction to a New York publisher, a Hollywood producer, who would love the work and then see the work into wider release. And the reward was basically the agent's commission. So I, I, what I basically did is I crowdsourced all of my early, early readers into being an army of agents for me. And, you know, they started to trickle in pretty quickly. Uh, you know, I'd get, oh, my brother's wife's cousin, you know, right. works in the mail room at Random House, or, you know, my wife's sister's husband, you know, uh, is a stuntman for Paramount Pictures. And I would get all of these different things where people would get the book and each one would sort of start its own little chain of events. But the real breakthrough came on Thanksgiving Day, 2010, when I got an a date email, that you remember forever and ever, I, and ever. I remember. I still have the email. <laughs> I bet you do. Um, a date that I remember forever. Uh, when a, an assistant to a Hollywood director, uh, and his name is Rafi, Rafi Krohn, uh, found a copy of the Reincarnationist Papers in a hostel in Nepal, of all wow. places, and he he picked it up. And I have no idea how it got there. He has no idea how it got there. He picked it up, read the book, cover to cover, just crushed it and loved the book. And he emailed me and he said, hey, I just read your book. It's amazing. I love it. I could totally see it as a movie. Has anybody claimed the reward yet? And I said, no. And he said, Eric, I'm totally going to get this made into a movie. 
And I was over the moon for about 24 to 48 hours. And then I sort of came back down and I was like, well, this guy could be, this could have been a prank. This could have been a joke. This guy could be who knows whatever. But he came back from Asia and he actually sent me a finder's agreement that was to the exact terms that I'd specified in the reward. And by the way, you can actually see the details on the reward at ericmykrantz.com. And there's a link to the reward page there. Um, and then Rafi started to work on this and he just never gave up. Uh, we, we, we worked on a treatment together, which is sort of a synopsis of a book for movie production. We worked on a beat sheet together which is like a rough outline of the three acts. And he took it out to several studios and he just never gave up Tabitha. And it took him seven years, but he eventually uh, got it sold to a production company called Bellevue Productions. And that's headed up by John Zalzierny. And John gave me an option for the book, which is like the first money that I ever got from right. entertainment professionals for the reincarnations papers. I was over the moon. And then John hired a screenwriter named Ian Shore, who wrote an ad, who wrote Infinite, the adaptation of the reincarnations papers. And Ian took, or excuse me, John and Rafi took out the infinite script to all the studios in one day and Paramount came back right after lunch and said, we want it. We love the idea. We don't want anybody else to be able to buy it. And just Rafi just never quit. Uh, you know, the old saying, Tabitha, that you can take a lot of no's, but you just need one yes. Just one yes for the problem. Rafi was the one yes. Was the right? yes. Rafi was the champion who read the book and believed in it and just never gave up on it. No, and I, I think that speaks to this myth of overnight success, because what's <laughs> going to look to a lot of people like it's his debut novel and look, it got made into a movie right. and you will say, yeah, however but many wait. years later, <laughs> right? it's not, it's never overnight. You know, it's that, it's that belief in the project. It's the continuous work. It's the, the willingness to put yourself out there and to hear the nose and to just say, well, yeah you know, I'm going to keep on going and, um, and, and to listen to feedback, but it's not an overnight success. I have another friend who's I've interviewed on here, but I actually went to school with her. Um, she, she was in my husband's class at, in college and she wrote, uh, one of us is lying, which is, um, a, a YA oh, yeah. book that's been on the New York times bestseller list for oh, like yeah. 900 years, you know, and, um, she and I had a lunch together once before the book, before she even had an agent for this one. And she, you know, and we talked about all the manuscripts that were collecting dust and how many times she's tried this process. And, you know, we, we were in our forties, you know, it wasn't like we were spring chickens by that, by, at this point right. in our lives. So, you know, so I actually, when I was interviewing her, we talked about this idea of what looks like overnight success is really all of this, the blood, sweat, and tears that you don't see in the background. And I love that you are saying this because people don't really understand what it takes to, you know, I mean, sure there's luck, sure there was right place, right time. And I'd say your serendipity was that moment. How did you push it to Nepal? I mean, right. But, right. Uh, but that still was, uh, you did all the work to create that moment of luck by doing what yeah. you did, you know, and I think that's a really strong message for anybody that's trying to, you know, get their work out there. And I think it can happen one of two ways, either you believe in a project and you keep working on that project until it gets some traction, or you keep writing projects and you put them aside and write it and put them aside until one hits. One is, you know, you've either developed the skill or it's just the right time in the market, or you, you know, and again, you've created your own luck. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the script slash manuscript slash novel slash, you know, uh, movie to be, movie to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how different is your final, you know, what got, what I assume got bought by a publishing house before it, it was, or do you still own all the rights to this book? Uh, no, I finally ended up going the traditional route, um, uh, at least for uh, U.S. and Canada. Okay. Um, and that's with Blackstone Publishing. And they've been wonderful to work with. Um, I, 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 I had a choice between Blackstone and one of the imprints, one of the big five publishers. And I actually chose Blackstone because um, they had a better plan to market and promote and launch right. the book. 
And I, I, I think that I, I feel like, you know, that we're, we're going to launch the book in 13 days. It'll be available in, in the U.S. and Canada on May 4th. Uh, and Blackstone has just been wonderful to deal with. For the international parts, uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, other English language markets and international translation markets, um, I still own all of the rights for that. And okay. one of the things that I wanted to mention, if we can, Absolutely. is Tabitha, I am using the same reward again for getting the book published in translation. So for anyone who, you know, knows a publisher or knows anybody in, you know, in Germany or in Spain or in Japan that can help get the reincarnationist papers uh, introduced to them, uh, I will give you 10% of whatever advance I get uh, when the deal closes. Now, I already, have a lead. Idea. <laughs> I already have a lead for Hungary and right. I already have a lead for Korea out of this. Nice. It's really, you know, it's innovative, but it, it also incentivizes people because what happens is it's somebody who really loves it and it's, it gets excited about it. And, you know, we have those fans that are like, wow, I love this is my favorite book ever. And you're like, great, but that's, that's leveraging that enthusiasm and saying, well, all you need to do is if you hear something, act on it and send it back this way and I'll share. Absolutely. And, and you know, and, and it allows those readers to be part of the journey with you. So, right. you know, uh, you know, Laszlo, uh, a new fan, making an introduction to a publisher in Hungary right. is going to be part of this process. Right. And, you know, if he chooses to and the deal closes, he says, knocking on wood, uh, you know, he'll be listed on my reward page on ericmycrans.com. Right. Same for Yoon with the Korean opportunity. Excuse That's me. Great. So, so let's talk a little bit about the story itself, if you don't mind, yeah. just give us a little teaser. Um, and then I, I am interested, so I don't want to forget, it, you know, how much has it changed from its very first draft to what obviously what's going to be adapted for the movie, she probably can't even say what it, you know, what's changed yet, because that's not, but just in your own evolution of, you know, producing it on this other platform, and then, you know, pulling it down from there and having it um, sort of probably reworked a bit for, for the new yeah, publisher. Yeah, so, so let's start with the novel. So the yes. novel is um, very close to what the original self-published version was, but Eric Mykrantz learned along the way the value of a really good editor. And I, 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 when I go back and I look at that first self-published version, I am mortified at some of the errors and, and mistakes in there. Uh, and I just, I love Sierra and my other editors at Blackstone. They're just amazing. And have really whipped the book into commercial shape. Um, the book itself is, uh, I've, I've, I've got pretty good at my elevator pitch here. <laughs> Takes practice, um, but you can get <laughs> <laughs> Practice makes perfect out of them. Yep. Um, it's, it's a story about a young man who is haunted by memories of two past lives. And when I say memories, everything, languages, loves, experience, skills, total recall of everything. And he thinks that he's alone in this world and live with this condition until he accidentally stumbles into another woman who has the exact same condition as him, except she's older. And she flips his world upside down by introducing him into a secret society of others who are just like them except they're centuries old. And uh, the secret society is called a Cognomina and it's based in Switzerland. And these guys keep coming back over and over and amassing skills, languages, knowledge, wealth. And these guys have been secret drivers to history. Wow. So where did you come up with that idea? It's fabulous. So I'll answer that question. Then I promise I'll get back to the That's other okay. one. This is more interesting. Question two. So <laughs> I actually have, uh, there's actually two really strong inspiration points that I moored this whole novel to. Number one is the idea, and Tabitha, we've all said this, right? Oh my God, if I only knew then when I was 20, what I know now, I would have done X, Y, or Z, or made better choices, made different choices, different investments. I would have bought, you know, I would have bought Amazon Apple stock at, or <laughs> at $5, right? Yeah. I would have yep. bought Bitcoin at a dollar. <laughs> 
Yes. So, but, but, you know, the, the, the thing is, so I took this to its sort of next extreme, which is what would it be like if you had the knowledge, not of a 40 year old or a 50 year old, but of a 140 year old, a 250 year old right. in a 20 year old body, what would that character be like? What would those characters experience be like? So that seemed like a, a bunch of interesting characters to me that I really wanted to write about. And then number two is I actually have three memories that don't belong to me. And they predate, you know, my birth in the late 1960s. And, um, but they're as real as any other memory that I have. They're very short um, and I can't explain them, but they're there. And so then I just, I expanded that and I said, what would happen if you remembered everything? Right. Right. What would that be like? And then the marriage of those two things was the idea was the genesis for the book. It's a great concept. Super yeah. fun. I, and, and, it, and it does lend itself to a very, very visual, potentially visual telling, you know, or yeah. scene by scene, you know, that's pretty cool. And I, I think that's what Hollywood liked about it is yeah. that it, it offers a lot. It, it offers a, a wide cinematic range because mm -hmm. you can be in different time periods because you'll go to historical flashbacks when a character learned some fact uh, that's, that's pertinent to the plot or learned some skill that's going to advance them from act two to act three. And it just gave them a very broad canvas mm -hmm. to explore the idea of the book. Now, one of your questions was, how is the movie gonna change from the book? Um, the first question, uh, the, the, my first answer to this is that I'm not exactly sure because I have not seen uh, a screening of the movie. And I did see a copy of Ian Shore's script uh, very early on, but that's gone through a lot of revisions sure. between when it was sold to Paramount in 2017 and when uh, Antoine Fuqua started putting, uh, director Antoine Fuqua started putting actors on camera in 2019. Um, there are some things that that do change, and and it's gonna it's gonna be understandable why they change because the book itself is very introspective and very uh, you know we get into Evan Michael's head and exploring what that existence is like being alone, having being haunted by the memories of other people who lived before and having those experiences, but not having any context for those. And then trying to get along in the world. That's very sort of in your head, which is perfect for a novel, but really difficult to do on the screen, right? Sure. But I think Ian Short did a great job of capturing that and capturing some of the challenges that come with uh, living multiple lives, and where once you've lived enough lives and you've come back several times, you're going to have confidence that you're going to come back again. And as soon as you get that confidence that you're going to come back again, a lot of concern around risk and consequence in your own experience goes right out the window. Right. Because That's well, a really I can interesting do theme to play with. Exactly, right? For and this sure. is one of the things that I played with in the book. And this is one of the things that Ian captured in his script, at least the version that I read, is that, you know, there are people who just are, well, hey, it's going to be, you know, fast cars and cocaine and whatever I want right. to do on any given Wednesday. And others, right? It's like searching over and over for a truth that they, you know, that's somehow eluding them spiritually, that they're not progressing uh, toward, you know, some resolution, they just keep coming back over and over. So that I think is going to be in there. And there's probably going to be a lot of action. If you, if you know, Antoine Fuqua, and you know, Lorenzo de Buenaventura, uh, these guys uh, do a lot of action and have a lot of kinetic energy in their films once they're on the screen. That's pretty cool. I think that, you know, it is interesting when we think about the best stories that have gone books to film, you know, they're not exactly the same, they, you know, they're truly created for the new medium. And, but, but they do, they keep the essence, the spirit, the, the underlying, I, what I would say the story versus just the plot action, you know, cause yeah. you can, you can change that up in service to the story to meet the medium that you're, you know, even when I had my books produced on audio at a certain point, you have to let that voice actor interpret you know, certain things. And you just have to sort of trust that you, you made a good choice in, in who that was and, and made a good choice in your screenwriter and let it go from there. Yeah. But that theme of 
when you take mortality off the table, I, I, I love that. That's a great question. And it really pushes some interesting, it pushes the envelope and some storytelling, like, like altered carbon. Did you ever see the, the, um, uh, I did. And I, and I actually read, uh, Richard Morgan's book. Yeah. Uh, and I that loved series that. That was, was really good. Phenomenal. And that was a premise was what if you take mortality off the table, what happens to people and their morality? And it's just a really brilliant, um, exciting thing to play with so that, yeah that's i true. agree right. and uh john zalzierny saw he actually compared the reincarnations papers to altered carbon when we first started talking that's about funny. an option and then the other thing that i'm really encouraged about even though i haven't seen the movie yet is lorenzo de bonaventura the producer he's produced the um the transformer movies red the red mm -hmm. franchise but people often forget that he was an executive at Warner Brothers when, and he was critical in bringing the Matrix to the big screen uh, from the Wachowskis. And that was a really big, very different, very unorthodox movie that is, it's a tremendous action movie, but it's really the movie is philosophical in nature. Absolutely. The franchise is philosophical in nature. And when Lorenzo de Bonaventura got involved in this project, one of the things that he kept comparing it to was the Matrix. And oh God, it's like you had me at hello, right? As soon as you had me at hello. In my book. <laughs> you I'm had like, me at the Matrix. <laughs> And then yeah. when I got to go on set and meet him, he talked about that again. Yep. And so, you know, if they captured that, and I believe that that Ian has in his screenplay. And you marry that with the way that Antoine Fuqua directs. I mean, he directs a lot of action and kinetic based right. movies, mm -hmm. but he always develops his characters really well. If you think back to Training Day, think back to the Equalizer franchises, he spends a lot of time developing the characters so that their actions and their motivations are understandable, relatable, and believable. And that is the key to good storytelling. And I'm really, I'm really excited with what he can do with this as well. And he and I had a great talk about, about that and about some of the nuance of the book when I got to meet him, when I was fortunate enough to meet him uh, on right. set. So sometimes, you know, when you um, sell your work and it's optioned, you don't have a lot of creative input after that. Uh, sometimes you do. It depends. I think it just depends on the leverage that you have or whatever. Right. But so do you feel like that your conversations with him were were productive? Did you have a lot of interaction? Did you get to go on set more than one time or are you uh, so mostly I'll wait and see <laughs> what comes out of that? Uh, so it was mostly I'll wait and see. Um, uh, I did get to go on set once and it was I was there for two days. They shot it in the UK. And, uh, and I went to England to go see it. Um, no, I didn't have any input into it other than, you know, I had a couple of calls and a couple of, uh, you know, I had like a, a, a nice lunch uh, with John Zalzerny from Bellevue Productions and Ian Shore. And we talked a couple of times about where the book franchise is going to go. And, uh, you know, they, they might, you know, I think they might draw some things from later on uh, in the franchise to be in this picture. But I think I just really got lucky with Ian Shore, Antoine Fuqua, Lorenzo de Bonaventura, John Zalzierny, who really, you know, you know, optioned it in the spirit of altered carbon. I think I, I think people are just seeing it in the right way that it's been intended and are taking it in the way that it needs to be told in Hollywood because it is a different medium totally. and you have to respect that it's a different kind of storytelling. And I'm just super excited to see what they've done. Yeah, I, I can imagine how exciting that is. What a moment to, to yeah. know or, or to be on the set and just be like, yes, my brainchild right here, <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, that, that, that actually happened. And, um, you know, what, going on set, by the way, I was, I was terrified. I was so nervous. I had no idea what to expect. And then, you know, I go there and, you know, the first person I meet is like the number five producer in Hollywood, Mark Varadian. And the first thing he does is turn around and int introduce me to like the number two behind Steven Spielberg, awesome. producer in Hollywood. This is Lorenzo de Bonaventura. And I don't normally rattle because you know i've been in you know silicon valley and and stuff for 20 years speaking to large groups of people but these guys it was just like i was felt like so alien and so out of touch and so out of my element and these guys couldn't have been nicer and uh, you know they talked they you know walked me through how they're making the movie 
how everything works. And it's basically American manufacturing at the end of the day. Um, and it's a product that they manufacture and then ship all over the world. And then on the last day, Lorenzo de Bonaventura puts his arm around me when we're walking back up from the, from the craft tent from, you know, getting like a cup of coffee. And he says, Hey, look around. This is all happening because of your idea, your book. I was Isn't like, that amazing? Ah, I just fluttered away after <laughs> right? that. <laughs> it's like the moment I can go now. <laughs> it's exactly. My yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. Just everybody that I've met in Hollywood is just the nicest people. What a, it's a great, what a great experience. And, and, you know, that is a congratulations. It is your story that somebody enjoyed enough and it spoke to them enough to produce it into film um, mm-hmm. in such a big way. And B, your tenacity to get it done, you know, to get to see this book, this story out there, uh, you know, that's a, that's an amazing thing. So before I let you go, just so you, you mentioned you're working on the sequel. I am. So what's, that's your, that's your, um, do you imagine it, it a series or, or is it a trilogy, a sequel? You know, how, what do you, what do you The sequel have? is here in manuscript it's format. In manuscript. Uh, it's in draft number six right now. As um, it goes, indeed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know how that goes. Uh, it'll probably go through one more draft before I ship it out to beta readers. And it'll be the second book in the series. There's at least three books okay. in the series. Um, there's opportunity for more uh, if I want to go there, but there's certainly three big books that are going to anchor it. And uh, the second book, uh, tentatively titled The Cognomena Chronicles right now, uh, should be ready sometime 2022. Um so that's what I'm doing with my new full-time writer Writer's uh, gig. <laughs> for my leave of absence, right? Yes. In polishing that guy up. Good for you. That's amazing. It's, it's so exciting. I'm, I'm really excited for you. I think and then, that. And then, and then if I could get back to one other point, yeah. you talked about the tenacity. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of tenacity, uh, but you know, I, I, I'm a believer in the old axiom. Uh, the harder you work, the luckier you can be, Right. So if I hadn't self-published the book, it would have never been on Amazon. It would have never been purchased and taken to Nepal by who knows whom, right? Thank you, whoever that is out there in the world. Um, You know, so there's something to be said for tenacity, work, and hustle. Mm -hmm. But the real message that I have for other writers out there is get your work in front of readers. You're going to be told no by agents, by publishers, that's fine. That's part of the gig. But get your work in front of the people in the publishing industry who matter most. And that's readers. That's the end consumer. Because they'll tell you, to your point, they'll give you advice on what to improve in your book. And you never know. You might be like me. You might be like Andy Weir or E.L. James, who really, you know, kind of you know, had a lucky break off the, you know, but with the help of their readers by, you know, uh, by, by taking the book word of mouth to other people and, you know, just get in front of readers. That's the key, get in front of readers. And then the other thing is, yeah, there have been a lot of people who have made this possible. And I'm just so humble and honored that they chose my book idea, the reincarnationist papers to, you know, make financial investments in, to make business investments in, to make investments in their career, to work on this idea. You know, Mark Wahlberg's, Antoine Fuqua's of the world, the Chiwetel Ejiofor's of the world, they can work on any project they want. And I'm just so honored that they chose this story to tell. It's, uh, it's really humbling. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for being here today. This was so exciting and interesting. And I hope that our viewers slash readers and uh, you know, we'll pick that up and I look forward to seeing the movie and reading the book and, and congratulations again, a really amazing story. Mm-hmm.